thank you for coming. Uh, I think the first thing I have to explain is why do you have a geographer standing in, in front of you who clearly hasn't spent a yeah, enormous number of decades looking at education and things to do with ability. So this may become evident, or my lack of uh, knowledge may become evident in the next 40 minutes, but I want to explain to you why I got into this. I have been interested in the gaps between people and between places for many years, in why do some people have more money than other people, why do the chances of people having a job vary, and why has the gap in those chances got wider, why do we have health differences in the country and why do we put up with them growing when they grow and if you look at all of these inequalities and you try and look at the reasons behind them, you end up looking at education and it's not necessarily because our educational systems create uh, these inequalities, it's because there are theories about how people are which justify inequalities. If you think that people are very different uh, from each other, there seems to be two of me at the moment, I've got an echo. <laughs> um, so if, you, if, you, if you think people are very different from each other, they are inherently different, they have different potentials. So some can rise up and do great things and others are never going to amount to very much. Then a good system uh, that recognises that would reward some people with a very high income and others a low income because you'd have to compete for those really able people and there's so few of them and the masses, there are lots of those and so you don't have to pay them very much. So you end up being forced to look at theories of potential and theories of inherent differences in people if you are trying to explain why some people are quite comfortable with very high rates of inequality and think that any attempt to reduce them is going against some kind of biological set reality. And also if you want to understand why other people find high rates of inequality so abhorrent, because they don't believe that there are these fundamental differences between people's actual potential. So you end up looking at theories of education and theories of people. Now, this young man behind me uh, is my father. So hopefully I share 50% of my genes with him. Uh, you can decide by having a look. Apparently you all look like Guardian readers. <laughs> I'd, I'd love to know. You never know, there could be a Guardian reader gene. You know, and it might also end up with sort of particular Guardian reading faces. We, we could test this. Anyway, there's my father. And there's, there's a reason for, for showing a picture of him. And for asking you whether I look like him. Some of you may think that you've come to listen to somebody with a brilliant mind, a celebrated Oxford professor, no less. However, there is a problem with this. I haven't got a brilliant mind. I am not good at writing. Much that's been published with my name on the front has been rewritten by many other people before you get to read it. A few of them are here. There's Stacy over there who did it early on for me. Um, I was a slow reader and I still am. I'm not bad at mathematics, but not exceptionally good. I do manage to remember a lot of statistics, but no more than many people remember about their favourite sport. Other than that, my memory is poor. I'm a non-starter when it comes to other languages. I do work harder than I need to, which may be unusual in academia once you've got a foot on the ladder. However, <laughs> I do not work as hard as many men in low wage jobs do, and I almost certainly do not work as hard as most women do. In many ways, I am of average ability. Now, before you go away saying, what a modest person I am, I've got to admit that my dad wrote this, <laughs> which, is why, <laughs> which is why I've been reading it out. And he says he wrote it because it is true. Right, the purpose of, of my lecture is to try to show you why it is true, why some of us really are not that special, all that different. We don't vary enormously in potential. This is a very emotive area in academia. It's hotted up in the last five years, so it's very interesting. A lot of it may be influenced by where you come from and what beliefs you grew up with. And I want to show you a few things that you may not have seen 
before. There's a kind of glasses half empty, glasses half full thing about the word potential. I spotted the word potential first about 15 years ago, beginning to sneak into government documents and wondered where it came from. Uh, you know, we will help every child to achieve their potential. The university is looking for young people who have got the potential to most benefit from what it has to offer, all these words. The word potential appears again and again and again to kind of justify why you might not do that much for some children or why you really want to do a lot for all children because they've all got a lot of potential. As far as I can tell, the word first appears in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, which was an incredible document produced several decades ago, uh, which says that every child must be educated, government must do all steps to do it. But it also says for somehow up to their potential. I haven't been able to find out where that got into the rights of the child, but that is where it is. It is in that central UN document. <coughs> I'm just going to show you just two slides of cartoons. I've done this lecture before in Bristol where I made them watch uh, 20 uh, slides of this cartoon because I like it so much. So please do take a note. Some of you may have seen this. This went viral early this year. It's a cartoon produced by Toby Morris. I've never met Toby Morris. Uh, Toby is based down in New Zealand. And Toby became interested in inequality recently because he read a book by a man called Max about inequalities in New Zealand, which are quite high. Not as high as here, but higher than in most other rich countries. And to try and explain the problems of inequality, uh, Tony drew this series of cartoons for a little boy called Richard and a little girl called Paula. And Richard grows up in a wealthy household. He's warm, he has all the kind of toys to play with. He gets a lot of attention, he gets spoken to a lot. His vocabulary becomes extensive early on. Whereas Paula gets ignored. Mum and dad have far less. Mum and dad don't necessarily stay together and so on. If you can imagine another kind of 20 stages through their childhood, their education, the debts they get into, and what happens to them later, you end up with them finally meeting. Uh, whenever I'm at functions at the university, I keep on thinking of this slide. Um, <laughs> and there's, there's Richard in the bow tie, talking about we need less whinging and more hard work. I'm sick of people asking for handouts. No one ever handed me anything on a plate. And there's Paula handing him something on a plate. And of course, all his life, he had things handed to him on a plate. Um, and we're very, very aware of, of this in Britain. Um, a proportion of young people in Britain um, have so much handed on, onto a plate, I, I worry, actually. I wouldn't, I'm very glad nobody handed that much onto a plate to me, to be honest, because the expectation on a small group of, of young people who have enormous amounts of money spent on their education is massive. Um, there's about a six-fold difference in the education spending on different groups of, of children in this country. And that's before you look at all the other things that affect what happens to you. But could it be that even though we know these things matter, within people there are still differences? And if Richard hadn't had something special in him, he never would have got to wear the bow tie. He'd have done OK, but he wouldn't be up there. And, you know, if Paula had just had a little bit more of a spark about her, maybe she wouldn't be waiting on tables. That's the kind of thing we're interested in. Is there something else in us, you know, inherent? Particular parts of our genome that mean that some of us are going to find it easier than others. There is an absolute obsession with this uh, in education, in medicine, in psychiatry. For the last five years, six years, we've had genome-wide study results. Um, I won't try to explain these because I'm a geographer. But the nice thing about genome-wide studies is that they can look for correlations between educational ability and outcome across the whole genome. So you don't have to identify the particular parts that might be the so-called IQ gene. What those genome-wide studies tend to find is tiny effects. So some children do appear to have genetic advantages when it comes to some things. Some of us are more geeky at maths. Some of us might find languages very difficult, and a little bit of it might be inherent. 
when I say a little bit, what I mean is the differences that have been found so far for genome-wide studies are one-tenth of the size between the ability of girls at 15 and boys at 15. And girls at 15 do do better than boys at 15, but you know, it's not massive. It's, there are small things. So there is geekiness. Um, if you're at Oxford University or came here, you may well be a little bit more geeky. You have to ask yourself why, if this geekiness was advantageous, everybody didn't evolve to have it. Uh, and you'll know that it doesn't take much of an imagination to begin to work out why. If everybody was geeky, things might go badly wrong. <laughs> so you can see why there might be a bit of a variation that's happened there, but it is small and it is not huge. So what's happened in academic circles? People have reverted back to twin studies to try to claim that there's these huge differences between people. And the reason I've got a slide up from the matrix there is all of this is kind of about a society in which, you know, what would it be like if we were all separately cocooned in little boxes and the boxes were identical and then you could see what happened to you? That's not how our society is. There is something very, very odd about twin studies. Uh, there's a meta-analysis that was published a few months ago of thousands of twin studies. And the really odd thing about it was there were only a few dozen on things like cancers which would be really useful to look at for twins. You know, things where there were obvious differences. And the biggest group was studies of IQ. There's some kind of obsession amongst people who control the cohorts of twins with looking at things which really are much less important and not looking at the kind of things where having exactly the same genes as somebody else is likely to be quite important. So why? Why does this happen? Why do, why are people so interested in it? And it's, it's because it really matters. If you look over the course of, a, of the last hundred years of these kind of arguments, a hundred years ago, the debate was dominated by eugenicists. Galton had won. It doesn't matter whether it was George Bernard Shaw or whoever. Everybody was a eugenicist. They believed that there were these inherent differences between people, and it explained why some families were at the top and others were at the bottom. H.G. Uh, Wells wrote a book in which he said that the Darwins and the Cecils would carry on being great families generation after generation. Uh, I don't want to be mean to the Darwins and the Cecils, and of course there's a writer who's a Darwin still, I think. Uh, there is a banker who's a Cecil, but you probably, most of you, don't know who the Cecils are. Um, this idea of, of families of great pedigree that there was, which it made complete sense that you would begin to think like that in the aftermath of the origin of species and so on. But it just doesn't work out when you follow the families of great pedigree forward. You know, by the time you go two, three, four generations down, I'm afraid they're just like everybody else. And when you look at who's come up, you discover that people who've done very well, their grandparents didn't do very well. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't inherent biological differences among us, because when you randomly scramble 50% of one person's gene pool with 50% of another's and create a baby, there's no need for that baby to be actually inheriting anything particularly special from the other two. It's a combination the random combination of those genes that creates a new person. So we shouldn't think that things should pass down families. But it is still possible that within people, because of that random combination, some people might be better at some academic things than others. Not just academia, all kinds of things. <laughs> they could be better at shooting. Uh, they could be working, I do like his socks. Um, sorry. I was brought up on Dr. Seuss, it probably shows. Um, so fox and socks and so on. Um, you know, there could be differences amongst us that mean that some of us will be better at some things than at other things, but 
we learn things collectively by talking to each other, not by working it out on our own in our little plastic bubbles in the matrix, right? And when you talk to each other, this wasn't obvious to me until somebody explained to me about shooting these birds. You know, it really isn't that clever to shoot birds that have been bred so they fly in a straight line. <laughs> you know, it's not a particularly impressive thing uh, to be able to do. But you only learn that. It's not necessarily that great for an environment to hand over large amounts of land to breed these birds so people can come up from running banks in London to shoot them. You know, but you have to talk to each other to find that out. It is quite hard to discover this all on your own. Right. And I mean, I'm jumping a long way here, but we kind of run a system in Britain where we have a theory, a bit like they have in Tibet, that there is a golden child, the one who's going to be the next Dalai Lama. And when the Dalai Lama dies, you have to go out and find that child with the inherent thing in them and bring them in so that they can be the new super beings. <laughs> and that's how our university hierarchy and other countries' university hierarchies are set up. It's just ours is a little bit old um, and ours is a little bit extreme. In much of the rest of Europe, you go to your local university. You don't have a special university to find the special golden children from all over the place. And it's not just Europe. It's Scotland, um, or it's the United States of America, where you go within state. Right? We are strange, but you can defend our strangeness if you think that there are a few people who will really benefit from having a lot more attention paid to them than other people because they are inherently better placed to benefit from that. Now, I don't have an objection to having a strange university with strange tutorial systems that give people a lot of attention. Uh, I would prefer it if, if you tried to target that attention to people who would benefit from the attention, not because you think they're special, just because there are a set of children at 18 or 19 who would quite like to see the same adult every week and you know, have 50 libraries and not go nightclubbing much. And if that was your basis for selecting people to that kind of a place, rather than trying to say, we're finding the special people to become the future leaders, <coughs> because only people who do PPE here can possibly be a good prime minister, <laughs> and create great policies that mean you do sensible wars and your economy is wonderful and the rest of it, you know, it's... I think you want a hiding to nothing and you begin to look a bit silly. Whereas if instead you say that for people who would really benefit from a particular environment, um, who were geeky at school, who may have been teased, coming to geek heaven is actually very, very, can be very, very good for you. And I, I'll try not to drop myself in it any further this. But for other young people who really want to get away from home and who don't want anybody looking over them and knowing what they're doing, um, and who don't want to be competing with others as much and who don't want to feel that it's a hothouse environment, it could be a very bad place to be. Not because they have less or more ability, but just because children vary. Now, I've got a cautionary tale at this moment. You can see my ability to put my foot in it and in, you know, annoy people and embarrass myself. Um, so I'm going to give you an example uh, from some work done in Cambridge. Uh, Clementine is here. And I did check, I did check with her. She was OK for me to show this. Uh, she managed to get into the Cambridge News last year uh, because she's done research on gifted children, um, where she says she wasn't sure that giftedness could be measured at all um, because behind every supremely able child, there really usually appears to be a rather pushy parent. Uh, <laughs> the problem is that we don't really want to hear about parental involvement in gifted children. We don't want to hear about practices we would identify as pushy because it de demystifies the giftedness. You can now find out and argue with her over drinks later on, because I've just revealed who she is. Um, Everybody loves stories about gifted children, whether it's Mozart composing beautiful tunes at the tender age of five, or mass superstar Ruth Lawrence getting into Oxford at age 11. 
there's something irresistible about the idea that freakishly talented kids can walk among us. Gifted's a really interesting word. It originally came from the idea that God gave you some particular gifts, and we now tend to think it's the gifts of the genes. Um, Clementine got a lot of hostile reaction to that piece in the Cambridge News. I think if it had been a newspaper in Sheffield, where I used to live, or Newcastle, it wouldn't have been so bad. Uh, this particular email caught my attention. Um, this was sent at 1.46 in the morning, and I'll read it out for you. Uh, have you ever, and it was published on the newspaper's website, so it's there now, have you ever considered that the giftedness of a child might turn parents into being what you characterize as pushy? That it would in fact be neglect of the gifted child to not provide extra backing for a child that is learning and acting using fundamentally different approaches to other kids. Now I'm not taking the mickey, this is clearly an anguished parents, and this anguish is pretty widespread. We can put up an extreme version of it, but the equivalent everyday ang ang anguish in a city like Oxford is what, particularly if you're middle class, actually only if you're middle class, because it's only an option if you're middle class, what are you doing not spending money sending your child to that better school if your child is able? Why are you imposing your terrible views and not helping them reach their full potential if you think that they are better? It is the angst of the middle class of a city like this, which at its maximum may have 35 to 40 percent of its 15 year olds in the private sector. It's the angst of the middle of London, which is 20 to 25 percent. It is the angst of Bristol, where I lived for three years. It's not the angst of Sheffield. <laughs> <laughs> not at all. And there, there, is, there are a couple of private schools in Sheffield. Um, and it's not the angst, of course, of people in all the rest of Europe or most of Scotland or Wales, you know, where you don't have this kind of selection based on ability to pay. The word potential has many meanings and, and many different ways you can look at it. Um, we have the potential in us to do all kinds of things. We are very plastic beings. You could, uh, in theory, take one of us, and at the point of our birth, put us back 10 or 20,000 years into the environment which was normal then, and we would probably survive. You couldn't do it the other way because we've developed new diseases, so I'm afraid you'd, you'd almost certainly die. Um, but we are plastic. We can be each other's worst enemies, we can live in a very vicious society, or we can be cooperative and we can be very helpful to each other. We are not fixed in how we have to behave. There's the bad joke from New Zealand about the different uh, Kiwis, but this is the world we live in. Very little social interaction between different social groups now. We are back in terms of income and wealth inequalities to where we were in the 1920s and 1930s at the time that Lady Chatterley's Lover was written, about the issues that Lady Chatterley's Lover was written. Lady Chatterley's Lovers could only be published in the 1960s because we had become so much more equal as a society in many ways, including education, the very beginnings of comprehensive schools, that when a judge said, is this a book that we'd like your wife and servants to read, <laughs> that was it. Sadly, we're going back the other way. At the, at the moment, and our children are not mixing in the same way as our children didn't mix uh, back then. Here are the uh, GCSE results for different kinds of schools. True comprehensives, not necessarily all true, you can buy your way in with house prices, but 64% of kids, and you can see the, the pattern there. We have 26% of children in selective state education of one kind or another, including church. Um, and you can see the difference there. The private sector is tiny, it is 7%, it bobbles up and down, never manages to get to eight, never gets below six. But it's normal to pass there. And that tiny little 3% to the secondary modern schools that we still have. We're still dividing. And that 64% who are going to comprehensives, in this city we have five, and you're basically paying about 100,000 pounds a time you move between each catchment area of those five. If you treat people as clever, they become more clever. 
this is well known. I'm probably teaching the majority to suck eggs at this. And if you tell people that they are stupid and not very able, or they're at a school where nobody expects very much from them, they do worse. It's called the Pygmalion effect. Um, the putting people in the houses effect. Harry Potter, uh, J.K. Rowling had it here. The sorting hat was looking inside people's heads. It's this idea. Uh, there's nothing hidden in your head the sorting hat can't see. So try me on and I will tell you where you ought to be. Uh, interestingly, if you have read children Harry Potter books and got through far enough, uh, you'll know the sorting hat rhyme changed later on in the series. Uh, I think it's not as good a rhyme, but it's a nicer sentiment. So the sorting hat later on says, I'll sort you into houses because that is what I'm for. But this year, I'll go further. Listen closely to my song. Though condemned I am to split you, still I worry that it's wrong. I, th I think that was J.K. Rowling beginning to worry about academy schools and, <laughs> and um, the way that academies can uh, choose who they take at age 16. And all our schools in Oxford are now academies. We are going back to secondary moderns and grammars again. I, there is a vicious debate in the twin study literature about inheritance. It is strongest in criminology. A paper was published last year saying that there should be no more twin and genetic studies of supposedly deviant people with criminal genes. But the number of studies of people with supposed criminal genes is rising and rising. Um, I'll, I'll leave off that now, but if you want to talk about it, this area of research really matters because there is a growing argument amongst a small set of people in academia that says that some of us are inherently more criminal than others. Now, some of us may have traits that make it easier for us to be criminal in certain situations. Uh, the one I have seen is a quite a good correlation between having a slow heartbeat <coughs> and being a successful burglar. <laughs> but it isn't that having a slow heartbeat makes you a successful burglar. It's that if you are a more anxious person and you start burgling houses, you give it up more quickly than somebody who's calmer <laughs> about, about doing it. But you will find, you will find lots of, of correlations all over the place. Um, we have statistics being published, particularly by the OECD, uh, which suggest that we are of very different ability. They gave all children a level from one to six. Six is the genius strand. I've forgotten the exact thing they call it, but it's only around about 2%. And I'll let you read the figures there for how much it varies in the various PISA tests between countries. It, it's just silly. It's silly, it's also volatile, it suddenly goes up and down. Um, it's not sensible. I'm gonna show you some figures later from PISA that I like because, well, I probably like them because they prove the point I wanna make. Um, but I like them because they're much simpler figures. They really are simple test results. This level six children comes from applying a model to the test they do to put children in a particular bell curve where on average, globally, only 2% are in the genius strand. 2%, by the way, is the same proportion that Aldous Huxley identified in Brave New World as being in the genius strand. It's the same proportion that appears in 1984 by George Orwell as being those who will be running the party and ruling over everybody else. Um, here are the proportions for the Netherlands. This is the supposed ability of the children of the Netherlands. So you've got, oh, advanced, that's the word they use. 2% are advanced at age 15, can use scientific concepts. 11% are developed, 25% have got effective knowledge. Then you've got some 28% of Dutch kids who are simple, 20% whose knowledge is barely adequate, 11 who are limited, and 3% who have known. <laughs> now, I first published this graph in 2010 in a book called Injustice. Uh, I've updated the book in 2015. It really is the book that this lecture is based on. And it was really gratifying to see that OECD had changed what they do. What they changed is they no longer use those labels. <laughs> but everything else about their methodology has stayed exactly the same. I don't think it's necessarily my book. I think a lot of other people noticed. But they didn't change the method. They really do. There's a group of people who really do think that's how our children come at 15. But they're aware 
uh, that a lot of us might not take it very kindly to being told that 98 percenters are not really up to ruling the rest of us. And this is part of the problem with the debate about potential. The people who do believe that there are vastly different potentials are not stupid. They're very aware that if you tell the public that most of you are not up to leading, most of you could not do complicated things like swan around in a suit in the city of London talking to other young men <laughs> and phoning them up to fix the LIBOR rate, um, people may not be impressed by that. So you don't tell people, if you believe that we are inherently different, <coughs> you just tell your friends. You tell a small group of people that you mix with that this is the case, but you don't broadcast it. And that's why it takes quite a long time and quite a lot of reading to actually find how many people at the top of society do believe in these differences. This is a pie chart which I think is much more real. This is a pie chart produced from data collected from 1984 all the way to about three years before the crash about how most people in Britain were doing economically. And only 31% of us were living comfortably. 48% were coping. Coping, you have to be English, I'm afraid, for anybody who isn't English. The English have particular meanings to their words, but coping you know, means something. Difficult to manage. <laughs> it's like keep the aspidestra flying. 15% uh, finding it difficult to manage, and 6% very difficult. That's, of course, got worse, but, you know, think about how children are educated when this is how their parents over such a long time period have described how they're getting through life in repeated social surveys mm -hmm. to governments. This is the kind of thing that limits our potential. The graph there is all about poverty cycles, but the, the tweet's far, far nicer. Uh, somebody called Free Palestine tweeted Boris some time ago uh, to ask Boris Johnson, Mayor of London, uh, why are you such a weirdo? And Boris replied, Mixture of genes and upbringing, I expect. Um, now, it's a kind of flippant reply, but um, I can't help thinking Boris looks a bit like Donald Trump, by the way. Don't you remember just me? Um, but, but Boris has been told and believes, and a group of people around Boris and why didn't the Conservative Party believe, that they are where they are, doing what they are, partly because of their upbringing, which gave them some proper education in the classics, which of course is what you need if you're going to run a city like London. And must have been some special genes to help him pass that entrance exam. Because otherwise, what could possibly, what could possibly defend having spent the equivalent of £35,000 a year on his education from the age of 13 and then heading off to somewhere a bit select and so on, unless he is special. Um, and this changes what, what we're like in Britain. And it also has other disadvantages. Now, this is data actually taken from North America, but the UK pattern is similar. We don't have as many samples, so we can't be as sure. This is rising level of depression amongst 15-year-old girls over time. It's going up. American society has become more divided over this period. Competition has become greater. You have to go to university now in the United States. The middle family has become poorer. The rich have got very much richer. Might have something to do why young women in America are becoming more anxious about life and the future. That graph comes from a study which was published to show there was no rise in anxiety. Because in that study, they found no rise. And the reason they found no rise is because they included samples from all over the world. Now, these studies began in the United States. So the more recent samples, which I'm not showing you here because I've taken the rest of the world out, were from Scandinavia and Japan and mainland Western Europe. And there, adolescent girls do not have such high rates of depression. So if you put those dots on the graph, it doesn't rise over time doesn't mean it's not rising over time. It means it's something particular to places like North America and, I'd argue, the United Kingdom. <coughs> but if you believe the OECD, everywhere is the same. These are the curves of distribution of children by ability in all these countries. Remarkable, isn't it? Absolutely incredible. You know, what an amazing scientific discovery. 
<laughs> you, you survey children, you test them, and then you produce the results of what you find, and you get these perfect bell curves in, in every country. Um, now, for any of you who've ever played with data, the minute you see that, you know what's gone on. Um, to see it, you actually have to draw the curves, because the OECD didn't choose to actually draw the curves of the data, they just used tables. You can also find out what's going on by reading the technical report of the OECD data, which came out, surprisingly, I think two to three years after the data's published, which said that they standardized the data to fit a normal curve before they published it. <laughs> right. But that wasn't told at the time the data was released, and newspapers you know, produced all these things about who's up and who's down. Right. And they, they standardized it to a normal curve because the economists, not educationists, it's the economist, actually he's a physicist who's in charge of it, um, who do the PISA studies in the OECD, honestly believe that's how we come. It's how everything is, it's how it ever is. It's all on some kind of a normal curve. Here's the, here's the rising consumption of Prozac and other antidepressants in Scotland, just to, you know, maybe all these things are coincidence, but I do think when you've got people in charge who do think we're strung out like this and competition is great and most people are not up to it, it's gonna make you a bit more worried. It doesn't have to be like that. I'm going to end with some optimistic uh, slides. Um, correlation is not causation, but it isn't also coincidence. <laughs> this is the relationship between a take of the best off 1% <coughs> and the proportion of people who walk and cycle in these countries, all the rich countries of the world for which you can get data. So the most unequal large country is the United States, the richest 1% in the United States, say 20% of all income. And hardly anybody walks or cycles to work in the United States, which is why it has the highest rate of obesity. Because the, the fattest, the easiest way to get fat is to sit in a car just exercising your foot. Um, as we head down towards more equal countries, much more normal countries, where the best off 1% take between 5 and 10% of all income, you'll see a much greater variety in travel time, but you've got the Netherlands at the top, where half the population are walking and cycling to work. Now, remember, these are countries with these identical bell curves of ability. It is more sensible to walk and cycle to work. Um, but what happens in the Netherlands isn't that people get up one day, check out the inequality index, work out it's low, and decide to walk and cycle to work. Uh, what happened is that people in the Netherlands in the 1970s became so upset by children dying on the roads in the Netherlands that they demanded cycle lanes, they demanded things would change. The planning system in places like the Netherlands and Denmark and Sweden and Finland and Norway and to an extent France and certainly Germany changed so that you put houses near where people worked so that you weren't having to do long distance commutes by car but also not to develop an economic system with such differences between people and jobs that you end up with people feeling they've got to live really far away from where they work because none of the schools are any good. You know, how on earth did we get to that situation of having to have a long distance commute from that? But this just shows that different things are very possible. The important thing here is if you look at other behavior like smoking or drinking, you won't find this correlation because you can individually choose to smoke or drink more. Um, so people in Japan smoke and drink quite a lot, people in France drink quite a lot. Um, you can't individually choose to create a planning system that allows you to cycle to work. Um, you can try and lobby, uh, you can sort of decide to cycle across the plain and slow all the cars down in Oxford, but you really do need the county council to build some wider cycle lanes and to turn Cowley Road into a pedestrianised road to help you do it in about 20 years time. Inequality affects us in many ways, and there's been lots of studies proving this. As inequality rises, we trust each other less. We understand each other less. That's obvious because we don't mix as much of each other. I would argue that we learn less well and we compete more. I don't think that competition is necessarily good. Exam results become more and more important as economic inequality in the country rises, because you really don't want to get those low-paid jobs. 
exam results triumph over actual learning, and they're going to take ability in maths, and they're going to take the OCD statistics for maths. Maths is nice because maths is somewhat similar in different countries, and you can test maths with a very similar examination. And what you get when you look at maths is this. this these are the results for maths ability at age 15. This is the latest data, which is data collected in 2012. And you'll see that in the United States, they have some of the worst average ability in maths, and it's the most unequal country. We are very similar to the United States. They actually spend less on private schooling than we do. And then you look up at South Korea and Japan, but also at other countries in the world, and you'll see that they do better, and they have low inequality. But this is 15. Okay, this is maths ability at 15. And, and my main point is, you can teach somebody to get an A at GCSE maths at 15. There's a particular way of doing it. You can memorize fractions and a few other things. <coughs> you can learn for that test, particularly if you have only 10 children in the class and one teacher. And you can get an A. But are you learning maths? So how do we test if people are actually learning? What you do is you test them again between the ages of 16 and 24 at that maths test. And what you find, this is what the OECD find, 2013, is that if you test people several years after they've left school at their mathematical ability, then in the more unequal countries, where exams matter, I would argue, but learning matters less, we haven't actually learned the maths. We've learned how to get an A, but hey, you've only got to do that in one day, and then you can go and do geography at A level. You don't ever have to do your maths again. <laughs> That's what happens in, in, a, in a country that doesn't really teach as much. Of course we still teach, and I'm over-exaggerating it, but the more the exams begin to matter, the less learning matters. And the less pressure you actually have on exams, and the pressure is less in the more equal countries, because in the more equal countries you can choose more what kind of job you do, because your job will not determine your social class and your children's futures. So exams matter less there. And what's happening? People appear to be learning more at school about maths, so that when you give them a maths test at 24, they can still do it. Now it could be that the Japanese and the French have got the special gene that means that they're really good at maths and will be. You know, in the United States and us, there's something wrong with us, but I just don't think it's likely. <laughs> it's all about politics. The idea of potential <laughs> is all about politics. It's, I don't know, I think that cartoon was funnier before recent events, but uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, no, well, there they are. There's a quote which I won't read out for you because it's getting late and I, I, I do want you to tell me where I'm going wrong. Uh, but from the blog called No Genes for Literacy. Um, about Michael Gove and Dominic Cummings from a few years ago, which if you're interested in this we can talk about. Um, Dominic Cummings was a spad for Michael Gove when he was the Education Minister and Dominic Cum Cummings wrote a thesis, I very gratefully did, I took a copy of it very quickly, where he said, that the top 1% in society do have special genes. Um, and it's interesting if you go and look at his attempts to find evidence for this. Uh, but he really wanted to believe that they did. And he's the SPAD, the special advisor for the then Minister of Education. The great thing was that he was so gifted uh, that he felt he would share this with us, where normally you don't get people in that position sharing their inner thoughts about how they think the world is. A couple of slides from, from Toby to end with. Um, so this is Toby Mo Morris from Word Swords. He did another set of cartoons, which is called The Tower of Inequality, uh, which is a skyscraper where at the top you have the billionaires, and he works his way down the tower to the bottom to look at what the conditions of people were in, in New Zealand and other parts of the world. And when he came to the bottom, he said, so the last question is, what can we do? I said, well, there are ideas floating around. Uh, you can have capital gains tax so that people simply can't make a lot of money out of other people. You have living wages, better funded low income schools. In, in New Zealand, there are parental contributions in theory voluntary, but not that voluntary to schools. Um, but personally, I don't know what the big answer is. <laughs> I'm not trying to say I figured it out. 
But I do know that when you come across something that's really wrong in life, you've got two choices. You either ignore it and walk away, or you get help and start fixing it. And that's Toby uh, yelling for help. We're heading back to a very, very diverse, divisive system in education in this country. We're heading back to spending ever-increasing amounts in our private schools, uh, much higher than they were before. I have statistics on private nurseries in London and New York. And from 2010 to 2015, the top fees for the top private nurseries have gone up about threefold. Really selective education for the offspring of the, of the supposedly truly gifted. We're seeing differences between our state schools growing as the house price differences between areas grow. We are seeing academy schools introduce new ways of forcing children out at 16. These are the children that they have educated. They can't blame any other teachers for this. But forcing children out at the age of 16 because their school is supposedly targeted at those with academic talent. We are moving back and away from that time when we came to all move uh, towards each other. And underneath all of this happening is that theory that children and all of us are a very different potential. Some of us can achieve great things. Most of us are mediocre. Some of us are truly dragging our knuckles along the ground. And that's just how it is. And that's all you can hope for. And we need to recognize those theories of potential. And we need to say there simply isn't the evidence to support them. We are much cleverer, much better. We work together and we work with each other and we teach each other and learn. The idea of simple great leaders leading us forward is dated and its time has gone. We have tried it, we have tested it, and the end result is not a very happy country. We've actually gone and done the experiment for many other countries of the world of what happens if you do have people from a very narrow, rich echelon of society running you. And the result is that their supposed brilliant gifts do not result in most people being better off. In fact, living standards have dropped for the majority of people. They don't result in a more peaceful world. It, it isn't better. And if we look at other countries in which these theories of difference between people are not so strong, they do better in so many ways as compared to us, not least, but that better at simply adding up. Thank you very much. Stephen Miffin, um, archaeologist from, Re from Reading, uh, has, has done lovely stuff about musical ability in Neanderthals and, and our, our background in it. Um, so you're lucky because it was piano. Uh, we outlawed drumming and different kinds of music because they were um, very bad for religious reasons for centuries. So if you're looking at variation in musical ability, yeah. uh, you actually see variation in civilization and the ideas about what music is over time. We do have this idea that some people um, are totem deaf and others aren't, and some people have got natural rhythm and others aren't. What you find is that in societies where it's normal to sing, and in our society where we used to sing around the piano because there's nothing else to do, uh, people are better musically. In societies in which it isn't normal to do those kind of things, they're worse. So, another anecdote, but sort of similar. Um, I was at a wedding a few years ago, lovely wedding in a field down near Avery, and people were dancing, and I'm sure you've been to these weddings in England where people dance, and a young woman from Brazil sidled up to me, and she said, you English, you teach your children to swim, but you don't teach them to dance. <laughs> now, and she was explaining, it's not that inherently we can't dance, but the reason why people dance so much better in other countries is they don't got what me and Stacey got at school, which was country dancing, bless it. Yeah. And we were made to do it in public, do you think that? Yes, I was. <laughs> I burned that out. Okay. Oh, uh, yeah. These things are music. Um, it, those are the big, big variations. Uh, and it's, it's very hard to find any evidence that 
the reason why somebody turns out to be very good is because they have it in them. You're selecting it after the effect. To prove that it is inherent, you've got to find some way of identifying it, pick 100 babies, use your scientific measure to tell us which ones are going to be the great you know, pianist, and then prove it, and nobody's done that. It's happening right now, isn't it? Right now is the first couple of weeks of the first five-year-olds being tested within three weeks of going to school, so they can be baseline assessed. And you can begin the process of working out whether they're going to get a D or a C in 10 years' time. And then you can reward the schools for valuing added them on that. Our children are now tested every year. They know what a 6C is and a 5A and the, and the rest of it is. Um, we are providing a service to the rest of the planet. So if you want to know what happens if you test children to exhaustion, us and to a lesser extent the United States, but we're worse than them, are doing the natural experiment to see what happens. Now we're partly doing it because the blob failed in this country. If the blob had won, it wouldn't be called a blob, it would just be society and there would be some strange people over there with weird ideas. Um, but because the blob failed, we're doing the natural experiment for the rest of the world, and we can do things like measure how we can do maths at 24, what comes out of it. At some point, we will stop being as strange. I would like that point to be sooner uh, rather than later, but at least we can tell ourselves the tragedy is that we're doing it through our children's lives and their levels of anxiety and depression. But we shouldn't ignore it. It is a natural experiment in what happens if you treat people in this way. And you can, you know, you can look at other countries. Um, Finland is the one that people always look at, and you'll find that everything isn't perfect in Finland. But you know, children do much better, and teachers do much better, and parents do much better when you don't I impose this on, on people. Um, I I suspect that the strongest drive will come from the supposed most able 10%, uh, the ones who've actually done or do quite well out of the system, the ones who get the A's and B's at A level, the ones who get into the Russell Group universities, <laughs> and then the ones who find that they can't get a well-paid job at the age of 21 and 22 and 23 and eventually struggle through. Um, you know, once you've got that group, well, my master's students, you know, who those who manage to find any job after three months um, from one of the universities I worked at, I'll be careful. Yeah. And then eventually, they begin by blaming themselves. They all begin by saying, I, they know somebody who got a job, and they might know somebody who got a good job, and they're unemployed, despite the fact they've got degree after degree at these A-levels. But a few months later and a few years later, they talk to each other and realize their experiences were the same. And they decide that they didn't particularly like the system <coughs> that they were put through. Then they also know that they can't do certain things. So my hope is that this generation, um, who find that, that young people coming from other countries of Europe who can do brilliant research in a university because they can actually program a computer. You know, they can actually do some formally. They can, you know, because they were taught to learn not taught just to get an A star on a particular day. Um, we know very little. Uh, we know, I think it's about two million in the US. Um, it's very affected by religious belief in the US. That's partly why it's so high. I, I'm almost certainly gonna get it wrong. In my head, I think it's 50,000 in Britain. Um, we used to work it out because we used to get really good counts of children. Uh, we knew. 99.5% of kids used to get child benefit, which told us where the children were. Uh, we knew where the state schools were. We had a rough guess at the private schools so we could subtract them. And then you could work out the ones that were, had either been abducted or were being homeschooled. Um, so it's not, it's not great data, but you can get a rough idea of where they are. And the other thing is you know when they come back in the system. Um, because very few people homeschool all the way through. Um, there is no evidence that homeschooling is necessarily good or bad as far as I know, but there will be people in this room who know far more than me. I suspect it's dramatically varying. Um, that, that's that's my, my guess about it. Um, and there are very 
uh, different ways you can school, and they're nice experiments. Um, so is it called Sunny Mead? No. Summer Hill. Summer, summer Hill. There's a Summer Hill in Japan, <coughs> uh, which I think is really, somebody's going to tell me they came from the sun. There's a Summer Hill in Japan, uh, which I think is a very interesting school to look at, because it's uh, not quite as um, laid back as the Summer Hill in Britain. But there are lots of international comparisons that you can do, and there are lots of experiments of different ways of teaching children around the world um, that we can study, as well as homeschooling. There are several ways of doing it. Maybe the easiest, even though history doesn't repeat, is to look at how did we do it last time? How did we get an education bill in 1944, which at least meant everybody went to school for free? Um, how did we then un untangle the mess of that? So we no longer had gold and silver and bronze children and we got rid of the technical schools. You know, we've done it before. We have demanded that we be educated uh, together before and we have <coughs> demanded that the differences between our neighbourhoods be reduced. Somebody even drove a tank through the Cutterslow Wall. They rebuilt it again and it took another 10 years. You know, this is a wall between streets in North Oxford to stop the children mixing, um, which in a way is appearing invisibly again because you can't mix at the age of 16 if you don't get the right GCSE results in that part of Oxford, in exactly that part of Cutterslow. Yes. Um, <coughs> But we've done it before, so you can look at how we did it, how we did it before. Um, the other thing I think is well worth looking at is what is the benefit of excluding your children at the top? And we're just beginning to get studies of this. So we have a cohort in Bristol who were born in the 1990s, who were measured in ability at age eight. And the fascinating thing, Bristol's a city as divided as Oxford. If your child was in the top 10% at age eight in Bristol, it shocked me, I, didn't, I, I guessed when we did this study we wouldn't find this. If your child's in the top 10%, makes no difference what school you send them to in Bristol, private or state or very poor state. So, if you're in Oxford and you really think your child's in the top 10% at age eight, you're wasting your money. <laughs> However, if your child is struggling at age eight, they'll still be going to university if you spend the money. And then, and the report came out from Hefke today, he may, or maybe the newspapers tomorrow, oh, how do children do at university? Children who go to state schools do much, much better at university than children who went to private schools. Why? Because people pay the money to push their kids up. I'm not saying they shouldn't go to university, but our current system means that, that we're pushing a set of children who are then more likely to actually fail at university um, and find it quite hard. In most, uh, almost all universities in, in this country, you turn up and nobody knows who you are. And nobody still knows who you are three years later. Now, if you've gone to a school where people only knew who you were largely if you caused trouble, but otherwise they didn't necessarily know really who you are and you got on and learned yourself but they taught you how to learn, you're really well educated to cope with a normal university. But if you went to a school where you're in classes of 10 and people really helped you and they pushed you to get that A rather than the B and so on, even though they never quite taught you how to do it, and then you turn up at, I don't know, Bristol where I've worked, Sheffield, Leeds, Newcastle, and there's nobody there to actually sit there and hold your hand for an hour a day, it's pretty awful. Um, and this is what I, what I mean about, it's not an us and them battle. It's not about the rich and the poor. Children at the very top of our society are doing very badly out of this system because they're being pushed to supposedly excel and get A stars continuously. And the A stars isn't enough. And a two one isn't enough, it has to be a first. And then you've got to get somebody to pay for your masters and that must be a distinction. And then you have to do a PhD for a job. When I did a PhD, it's what you did if you were very, very strange. <laughs> Nobody knew about it. And if you didn't care about the fact that you were not going to get on the housing ladder. Um, whereas people doing PhDs, not because they're interested in the PhD, but because this will help their career later on in life, it is a bit tragic. Uh, well, they have 25% of all the money spent on them. 
So you could say they should be 25% of all places, <laughs> um, rather than about 40 or 45. I, I wouldn't, it's, it's, it's no child's fault where they went to school. I think that's a very important thing to start off with, you know, if your parents largely choose where, unless you're lucky enough to have hippies or unlucky enough, your parents choose where you go uh, to school. Uh, the hefty results of all universities. There have been a series, not many studies in Oxford and Cambridge, uh, and Oxford and Cambridge in the past were the few universities where children from private schools did as well or better than state schools. Because when you turn up here, it is not that dissimilar from your top you know, private schools, in including, you know, not having to work out the electricity bill in your second year because you're, you know, you're kept as a child to the age of 21. Um, but rather than worry about what proportion of children from private school or not should be at universities, we need to worry about why are we spending 25% of our secondary spending on this 7% of children who are already supposed to be more able because they often have to pass a test to get in. In most OECD countries, they spend more on the children who are doing worse at school. That, that's what's normal in the world mm -hmm. at the moment. So, so we, we need to ask that. Secondly, if parents who are spending this amount of money on their children are not actually getting very much for their money, what a waste of time. And if it's also making it harder for teachers because you're missing out having some children in schools and so on, um, that's hard. But I can say it to you now, and nobody's attacking me yet, because in polite British society, well, in polite British society, you can talk about anything but where your child goes to school. But in polite British society, we all nod and go like this. But our elite, the majority of our academic staff at these universities, anybody else on an income of over 50, 60, 70,000 pounds a year might nod and agree and so on, and they send their children to the private schools. And they do it not because they're nasty, because they are afraid. 50% of young women get into university so that when I was a child and hardly, you could sort of see then, they're now afraid about what university they're going to get into. Even though all our universities, all, apart from three, our universities are expanding dramatically because they can take any number of children. So it stops being a worry about will my child go to university. And then it becomes a worry about will my child get into a particular small set of universities. So the pressure increases and increases. And of course, if you're in one of those special universities, it's entirely in your interest to go, hmm, we are rather good, you know. <laughs> Particularly if you've got an international market, and it becomes difficult to talk about these things truthfully. I haven't answered your question well enough, but we, we're at the bottom of the class. Only Chile, out of the whole of the OECD, only Chile spends more money on a small proportion of children than we do. So. We had, we've done very badly for, for a very long time. We've become used to it. Untangling it is difficult. Where educational systems have changed rapidly, they've changed by losing a war is the fastest way and having to produce something efficient instead. Um, you know, that, that, there's a lot of pressure, because you know, you're going to be different and stand out if you don't uh, worry about doing what your peers are doing. So if we separate our children in this way, if we have a, this degree of segregation going on, and then because what's normal is what the small group around you are doing, it reinforces that normality. And then of course, if you and your peers agree with each other, but you've got the blob and other people complaining, well, it's because they just don't know enough. Most of the facts I've said are in this book called Injustice, uh, why social inequality still persists. Uh, so that, that's where the bog fits in. Um, I wrote a little book called Inequality in the 1%. Um, but you, there's no need to read <laughs> what, what, what I write. Uh, Diane Ray from Cambridge is very interesting to read. And she wrote a blog on the website of the think tank uh, whose acronym is CLASS. I've forgotten what the you know, CLA double S stands for, but it's Owen Jones and Co's think tank. Uh, there's a lovely short blog there by Diane about what our schools could be like, what the future could be. And she's professor of education at Cambridge. I and mean, what's interesting at the moment is, you know, if you've got people in your elite institutions saying it's not great to be this elite, 
uh, it might be that we're back again at a time when things have become so extreme it's becoming obvious even to people who work in elite institutions. I mean, girls do better than boys all the way through, and the recent changes are incredible, except they're having a much higher levels of depression and anxiety, and their levels of self-harm are growing and are much worse than the boys. So, you know, you're getting all the A stars, but you're also getting damage to your arms. So yeah. um, you, you're right about the comparisons at adult age, and the older you get, the better they do. But in the 1970s, we were the second most equal country in Europe to Sweden. Uh, we were a much different place. It's not that our education system was necessarily better, but when you compare people uh, aged 50, yeah, it was, it was better than what was going on in other countries in Europe. And the, the other quite important thing is that shortly after the war, um, we were twice as well off as people in mainland Europe. We were just a much richer country because we won. In Greece, the schools still often have two cohorts, the ones who go early in the morning, then they all leave, and then another set of children comes to school because they never built enough schools. So in the past, you're comparing a very rich country that used to have an empire and had built its beautiful Victorian schools and its infrastructure, and also had very equal um, salaries and wages in the 70s, and had this wonderful new, brave new world comprehensive system that was so brave new world that the old secondary modern called Charwell here and the old grammar school called Littlemore, when they all became comprehensive, nobody in Oxford knew, well, what's the good or the bad one? Because, you know, the secondary modern had been in North Oxford. So there were a few years that some of us benefited from when it really didn't matter what school you, you went to. And I'm now of the age, I'm not that far off 50, <laughs> so I'm of the age which will be compared with people in countries which were much poorer. I think you got, what was it, 10 francs to the pound? What did you get? Yeah, in the past. We were, we were richer and better off and also more equal. Uh, we've become much more similar to Europe. In fact, our median household incomes are lower than in France and Germany. That's before we take them. So we're poorer now than mainland Europe. And we've also had the bias between us rapidly widen, where they've widened a bit in France, hardly at all in Germany. You know, if you talk to people in Germany about what school you go to, there are differences, but it really isn't like this country. And if you talk, our twin city is Bonn, I think. And I, I, I've got this passion that we should do a comparison of Oxford and Bonn. If you talk to people about the, the private school in Bonn, there really is only one. It's the school for the rather slow boys. And they laugh a bit. And their favorite rather slow boy is a man who's now come to be called Prince Philip, <laughs> who went there. You know, the, it's, not, it's a very different place. I, uh, my colleague is, draws the maps of the World University rankings. Um, well, British and American universities will not allow anybody to come in and do math tests on our students to see how good they are compared to students in other universities. Um, you could do it quietly. It, would, it could be interesting to do a comparison. Uh, the world rankings were begun by people in the, in the US and Britain. They helped sell particular educational magazines. There was a huge amount of vested interest in what they do and, and what they show and why they're created like. Uh, they are. I'm, yeah, it's, and it's business. You know, uh, two years ago, I, two and a half years ago, I left Sheffield. Uh, I, when I arrived in Sheffield, 10 years before then, we had hardly any overseas students. When I left two and a half years ago, a quarter of our intake, and in the two universities, that's 60,000 students, a quarter of our intake was from overseas, largely China and India and Malaysia. And the amount of money we generated from fees, from the rent they paid, and from the 5,000 pounds on average spent on getting there for graduation, the amount of income, the export income in South Yorkshire, by the time I left, every year from the overseas students was greater than the export earnings of the entire metal industry of South Yorkshire. And that is basically an arms industry. So it's not an unsuccessful metal industry. My granddad came here and was bitterly disappointed not to have got the first when there was only one. Um, 
if you project forward from when my granddad came here in the 1930s through to now and draw a straight line forward, you're talking about, I don't know, 50 or 60 years, they'll all get first. And then we can create a special star first and something else and something else. I mean, that, that's, that's the way it's heading. But maybe it won't be like that. Because if you look at that time from when he came, it was a time when somebody wrote a report about the number of imbeciles from the top public schools coming into Oxford and Cambridge. The university changed from the 1930s to the 40s to the 50s to the 60s. And its intake became much more mixed then people from grammar schools and private schools. And of course, the jobs they could go to in the 60s and 70s, bankers were only paid 100,000 pounds. <coughs> so why would you necessarily want to go from Oxford to be a banker? And you could live very well. You could get a house as a teacher in Oxford and you could start a family. So what you really want is not to worry about the number of firsts from Oxford. You want a society in which young people who graduate from Oxford University have real freedom of choice over what they go on and do, and are not just going to do teach first, it's called teach first because it's what you do before you go into the city, so that you can buy a house and start a family. And this is the dramatic change that's happening now. People cannot settle down, even graduates of the University of Oxford, a large proportion of them cannot secure a job that will enable them to settle down and have a family in the next 10 years. And if that doesn't change people's attitudes, I just don't know what will. Thank you very much. Thank you.